In the previous lesson, I introduced John the Baptist, who was considered by Jesus to be the greatest man ever to have been born of a woman. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. So why would Jesus regard John the Baptist so highly? As even greater than Abraham or Moses or King David. It's because John the Baptist was chosen by God to be the herald for the King of Kings. As a king's herald, John the Baptist had the vital role of going before the King of Kings to announce his arrival. However, there was a slight problem. The Jewish people back then had what we call today selective hearing. Of the thousands of prophecies spoken by God in the Old Testament, the Jewish people only believed the ones that suited them and ignored the ones they didn't like. Thus, they only believed certain prophecies about the Messiah, in particular, ones that portrayed him as a powerful king who would destroy their enemies. However, they selectively tuned out prophecies like the suffering servant passages in Isaiah, which foretold that the Messiah would suffer, be humiliated, and ultimately sacrifice his life to atone for the sins of mankind. No one wanted to hear about that part, so they simply disregarded it. This would come back to haunt them later, because although it was obvious that Jesus was the Messiah from all of his supernatural powers and unparalleled wisdom, these stubborn people could not understand why Jesus was humble and merciful rather than politically savvy and powerful. This kind of thinking led to the first confrontation between John the Baptist and the Jewish leaders. Because a multitude of people was coming to John to be baptized, naturally the Jewish leadership wanted to know more about him. So as chapter 3 begins, John is going about his daily baptizing when a group of rabbis arrive to see what all the fuss is about. and perhaps even be baptized by John. The minute John sees them, he immediately calls them out on their hypocrisy, starting a hostile confrontation. The rabbis had sort of a love-hate relationship with John the Baptist. They were curious about him. They wanted to know exactly who he was, yet at the same time, they saw how popular he was with the people, and they feared losing their own political power. Let's watch as this scene unfolds in Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit 
will be cut down and thrown into the fire. John was a direct man who didn't sugarcoat anything. Instead, he told it like it was and wasn't afraid of anyone. And while most common Jews held the rabbis in high esteem, John saw them for who they really were, hypocrites and false teachers who misled the people. Over the centuries, the rabbis perverted their religion, inventing hundreds of man-made rituals and laws that were not from God. These man-made rules, combined with their ornate flowing robes and their false symbols of holiness, gave the rabbis the appearance of holiness and helped them to command the respect of the common people, who were easily fooled by outward appearances. So John unleashes a tirade on them. He continues, saying, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. John's message was simple and direct. Repent. Rethink your life. Turn away from your evil ways. Because the King of Kings is coming. This is God's only Son. And if you want to worship Him, if you want to be accepted by God, then you first must repent. John's message stunned the Jewish people because they believed falsely that they were already holy by the mere fact that they were Jewish, God's chosen people. But although they were the race to whom God chose to reveal Himself to the world, they also had been adulterous and unfaithful and were therefore unacceptable to God. If they wanted to be a part of God's kingdom, they must first repent. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Here, John warns his fellow Jews, Look, you're not special just because you're the human descendants of Abraham. In fact, God can take these stones and make descendants of Abraham if he wants to. I don't care about your heritage, your nationality, your race. Those things can't save you. If you want to be saved, you must repent. John also implies, If you refuse to repent, then God will take these lifeless stones, representing the Gentiles, and turn them into the children of Abraham. And wouldn't you know it, that's exactly what happened. The Jews rejected Jesus, their king, their Messiah. And less than 40 years later, in 70 AD, the Romans completely destroyed Jerusalem and their holy temple. The Jewish people were scattered in all directions. And Israel did not recover as a nation until 1948, almost 2,000 years later. What's the obvious lesson here? Do not mess with the creator of the universe. He created you, and he can also destroy you. Jesus later reinforces this idea in Matthew chapter 10. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Since the Jews rejected their Messiah, God then selected the Gentiles, because they would accept and would honor His only Son. Jesus predicted this in the parable of the wedding banquet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. 
He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. But they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. He said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you can find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. So what meaning is Jesus trying to convey in this parable? The king who prepares the wedding banquet for his son is none other than God the Father. And the son who is being honored at the banquet is, of course, Jesus, the son of God. God had given the Jewish people an invitation to this banquet, which represents an invitation to the kingdom of heaven. But they rejected God's invitation. And by rejecting the daily invitations given to them by Jesus to believe and follow him. Verse 6 says, They seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. Here Jesus refers to the mistreatment and beheading of John the Baptist, and ultimately his own mistreatment and barbaric death. In the parable of the wedding banquet, God was enraged. Verse 7 says, The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Burned their city? What was this all about? Well, the king's revenge against these murderers to go and burn their city is an obvious prophecy by Jesus of Jerusalem's own destruction. And guess what? A few decades later, the Roman army marched right in and burned down Jerusalem, scattering the disobedient Jewish people in all directions for thousands of years. The Jews, those whom God first invited, did not deserve to come to the banquet because they rejected God's only son. Therefore, God then offered his invitation to the rest of the world. Well, John's rebuke of the self-righteous religious leaders, then reaches a boiling point. In chapter 3, verse 10, John tells them this. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. In this particular metaphor, John compares God to the owner of a vineyard. At the harvest season, he's looking for fruit. The vines that don't produce fruit, God will cut them down and throw them into the fire. Fire, of course, representing the eternal fire in hell. Salvation, heaven, and hell, these are consistent themes running through the Gospel of Matthew. 
Those who don't study the Gospels tend to have a selective memory. All they seem to remember about Jesus is his loving nature, love your neighbor, etc. But when you take the time to actually study the Gospels, to study the life of Jesus, you find that he is also a hellfire preacher, warning us about eternal damnation. You see this time and time again from Jesus. So what is John's overall message? Like the Gentiles, you too need to repent. You need to turn away from a life of sin and embrace a life of holiness. And like the Gentiles, you too require a symbolic water baptism, which represents an inward baptism of true repentance. These are the conditions you need to meet if you want to worship the one true God and if you want to be accepted into the kingdom of heaven. I'm CJ for the Visual Gospel of Matthew. Know what you believe and why you believe it. By the way, the whole reason why I make these videos is so that you can know the Lord Jesus and be saved. The goal of your entire human existence is salvation. That's it. There is nothing more important than ensuring your soul will go to heaven and not to hell when you die. It's more important than your job. It's more important than your family or any other human experience or accomplishment. The Bible is the Word of God, and it tells us that salvation is not something you can obtain by working hard enough or by being a good enough person. Salvation is not something that we can earn. The only way to be saved is to be regenerated or born again by God Himself. The Bible tells us salvation is a free gift from God, that God saves you, and that you cannot save yourself. So you might be asking, how can I be saved and know that my soul will go to heaven when I die? Well, Jesus says, ask and you shall receive. So say this little prayer with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask your forgiveness because you alone have the power to forgive sins. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. Therefore, I repent and turn away from my life of sin. And I invite you to come into my heart and into my life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. I give my life to you, and I believe that you will save my soul because your word says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen.